Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Hello, friends and listeners, and welcome to a new episode of the Thoth Hermes podcast. My name is Rudolf, I am your host, and this is episode 16 of season 8 of the Thoth Hermes podcast, already two-thirds into its eighth season. Wow, time is really flying. It's 12th of June today, the day we release that episode, and our guest here on the show today is writer and esotericist, spiritualist, Naomi Ozaniek. More about her a bit later, and for the moment, it's a great, great pleasure to have you on board here, to have you back on the Thought Hermes podcast. I assume many of you are returning customers, as we say, and... There are always a few who are new who discover this podcast for the first time, and it's, of course, a very special pleasure to welcome you for the first time here. I hope it will be for many returns. Um, as always, a little, little explanation of what's going on here. The Thoughts Hermes podcast is a podcast about the Western esoteric tradition, about all things occult, mystic, and also paranormal from time to time. And uh, I would also like to say that this is already the 130th episode that you can find online at the moment. Isn't that amazing? There were a couple that we took out of the internet because they were outdated simply, but 130 now with this episode are online and you can listen to all of them, either on your favorite podcast provider or Go on the website, thoshermes.com, T-H-O-T-H-E-R-M-E-S.com, and you will find um, all those episodes with the show notes. And that's the important thing, because with the show notes, you can get much, much more information than in the podcast itself, because there are links to the authors that we interview, websites, or to the spiritualists or occultists that we interview, <clears throat> more specific um projects so you'll find all that in great detail on those on those uh, show notes and of course also the music that we play we explain what music it is and by whom so if you like the music you hear on this show then you go also on the on the website and the show notes and you'll find more information about it there right i would also like to repeat something that i did last time and Two or three of very kind and very um, attentive listeners came back to me saying, hey, you announced Kai Kobad Radio, great, but you said now you hear the the intro music to Kai Kobad Radio, that little trailer there, and nothing came. Well, yes, sorry about that. I checked it out and I just made an error when editing this intro and also a second time later on in the show. I just made the same error again. It was not there. So what is Kaikobad Radio? Kaikobad Radio is a new 24-7 internet radio. You find it at radio.kaikobad.com or also on the Thoth Hermes website on the top of the homepage itself. And that radio brings in eight-hour loops really highly interesting and high quality podcasts and other content from the world of the Western tradition. We have 22 participants so far, creators who are on there, like the Institute for Hermetic Studies or Whence Came You or Martin Fox or Magic Without Fears or Occult Confessions or Occult of Personality and Glitch Bottle. I'm sorry, I can't name them all here. You'll find them all on the website. And Chris Roberts, who also wrote that great intro music to our show here on the Thought Hermes podcast, he wrote a jingle for Kai Kobat Radio. I wanted to play that for you last week. Now it's here this week. Now listen, this time 
It's really coming. The jingle for Kai Kobad Radio. Kai Kobad Radio. Got it? Okay. I hope it worked this time. It's lovely, isn't it? It's by Chris Roberts, as I said. And um, well, before we go on and play some more music now here, I would like to tell you also that we need you. Yes, we need your support. We need your support to maintain this show and to make it even more interesting. Please go on Patreon, patreon.com, and look for the Thoughts Hermes podcast. Or if that's too complicated, just go again on the website. It's all there on the website. And you'll find a button which brings you e ideally directly on the, on the page of Thoughts Hermes podcast with Patreon. You can also do a one-off donation, actually, if you want, on the website, on our website. You find a button for that as well. So... I hope you'll go there and will be kind enough and bring us some money for making this show happen. <clears throat> it would be really, really, really good. So the Kaikobat Signation is played. We play some more music now. And <clears throat> this time again, it will be music by somebody who has already offered twice music for our show here, Hassan Ismail. And as our topic today is mostly also Egyptian, well, he does not only Egyptian music, of course, and the music we're hearing here today is not entirely Egyptian. One of the three pieces is, but not the first one. The first one that we are going to hear now is a piece by Hassan Ismail, um, which is called As Within. Well, of course, hermetic, as you can easily discover, As Within, that we'll continue with. So without, etc. So as within by our friend Hassan Ismail will musically open this show. And I'll be back after this piece with some words about our guest Naomi Ozanyak and introduce her to you. Enjoy. <music>
As Within by Hassan Ismail was the first piece that we heard here today. And I hope you did hear Kaikobad Radio's jingle before, didn't you? Okay. Well, as a little supplement, I'll play you another jingle. Very similar, but not the same. Um, also for Kaikobad Radio, which we will use when we will do our first live shows that's also planned in a month or two so here is the jingle for the live shows a premiere nobody ever heard that online Okay, so now back to our show here today, um, Becoming a Garment of Isis. That's the latest book by Naomi Ozaniak that she published. Um, Naomi has worked within the realm of the Western esotericism since the 1970s. And she will explain in that interview to us very clearly um, how she came to all that. Um, it's a fascinating story that she's telling us. And she's become the voice of Isis very clearly um, there, but it's not a, a voice of one single goddess, as you might expect at first sight. It is rather an example, as she explains herself much better than I can do here. Um, it's rather an example for the Neteru, for the Egyptian gods, which are part of everyday life in the ancient Kemetic religion. Well, many of you will know that, but in a way that Naomi puts it and also experiences and teaches it, uh, and also teaches it to us in that book, which includes a nine-stage initiatory path of Egyptian spirituality. It is really fascinating and was new to me. And um, I think we had a very, very nice talk. I'm not today going to read from the book for you because um, taking out just a little bit doesn't really make sense. And that part where she explains how it all came together and started you will hear more, uh, a lot about it anyway in the interview. So what I suggest is just that I tell you we'll go right away to Portugal, actually, where Naomi now lives. Um, we I met her down in Portugal with my internet connection. Of course, I didn't go down there myself. And we spoke um, about becoming a garment of ISIS, but much more, and especially about her life and how it all happened in her life. So enjoy that, enjoy the show. I will come back after about, um, well, it will be about 38 minutes until I come back with another piece of music. That one will be related to ancient Egypt, of course, then. Enjoy. Here comes the interview. I have the great pleasure to welcome on the Thought Service podcast my guest Naomi Ozaniek, or Ozaniek, as I, as an Austrian, prefer to say. Hello, Naomi. It's great to have you on the show. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. And of course, the reason, the immediate reason, so to speak, while we are here today is a book that has been published. I believe it's now, well, three or four months ago already. The time flies. Um, uh, or with in the traditions and that book is called becoming a garment of isis and as it's easy to discover by its title we talk about um, kemetic religion let's talk about let's say it may be easily like that but that's only part of our talk here today and because i would like to use the opportunity to introduce you naomi um to our audience from from your personal point of view also you have been uh, writing so many books in the esoteric world from different aspects about chakras, about the tarot, about meditation. And um, so you are a very complete um, writer and I believe, of course, not only a writer in that in that area. And I'm sure our audience would be curious to get to know you as a person a little better. So if I may start with my first question um when and where and how did it all start for you when did you get in touch with 
at least consciously with the world of spirituality and um, um, how did it all take off? I think your question already holds an interesting word, which is consciously, because when I review my life, I think that all of these things were present unconsciously, even when I was a child. Yeah. And they were possibly things you didn't speak about, but you actually thought that magic did exist, that spirits did live very close. And that was probably my view of the world, even when I was an infant and certainly Mm -hmm. when I was um, somewhat older. Um, And those things never went away, although they were rather inconvenient. So when I was, um, well, as I grew up, I read a great deal. I read a great deal of um, mythology and then later comparative religion, then psychology, then all all of that area. And then um, I have to say it all... It all slightly, it all changed gear when I was um, primarily 18. And um, I got into a spiritualist phase, which lasted quite a long time. And then I emerged from that. And this is all part of a, of a single journey of many facets, as I'm sure you understand and your, your listeners will know for themselves. Absolutely. So all of those things were present in my life. And then my opening into um, the comedic path began when I was about 26. And before that time, I was a school teacher. I was married. My life had all the trappings of every normality you can imagine. And then everything changed. Um, I never expected to be a writer. I never expected to be really moving deeply into this area, though clearly unconsciously that is where I wanted to be. So that is the kind of background moving from normality to something else. (laughs) Right. Before we maybe come to that um, very moment where, as you just said, when Mm. it happened, so to speak, um, as a child, of course, we hear that often and i would even say personally i have a bit the same feeling that when i look back i see now things that they experienced when mm-hmm. i was maybe five or ten in a much different way than mm-hmm. how i looked at them even when i was 20 right um but um in your was that something that you had to fight for in your family surrounding or was it present with your family already. So were you to them a weird child who had to uh, fight its way or was it natural? I I came from a very weird family in many senses (laughs) because um, my my father was was born in Hong Kong. Mm. Um, My mother, my grandmother was Russian. So we were kind of immigrants into English culture, but we never quite fitted. So we always had a kind of outsider's view of what was considered normal and traditional and proper. Um, So I never really had to fight for those things. It was more a question of fighting outside the family. Right. Because society um, in those days, which let's face it is a long time ago, had no interest in meditation or anything Eastern. That was particularly bad. Um, And yet I was reading psychic research books, you know, serious books when I was 15, 16, trying to enter this world through any means that was almost acceptable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then came that, that moment where everything changed, as you said just before. Are you happy to talk about that moment or is that something that's I rather think, secret think, for you? I think, um, no, it's not a secret, but I think it's uh, not that interesting. <laughs> the moment that really changed my life was when I was 26. 
Mm-hmm. And that began in a, in a seemingly very ordinary way. I answered an advert in my local paper for what was then described as the setting up of an Aquarian discussion group. Okay. Now, that doesn't sound, doesn't sound very interesting in this day and age, but in 1976, it was like a, a beacon light going on. And I thought, all right, I'll, I gave them a ring. And they turned out to be no more than 10 minutes walk away. So I went and I joined the group. And that's when my life changed gear completely. So Aquarian, um, do we have to imagine that like a new age group or uh, Aquarian in, in no, what there was, sense? There was no such thing as new age then. Mm. It was a collection of basically oddballs. They were a, a, a medium. There was somebody who said he was a witch. There were various people of no particular persuasion who were just interested in spiritual things. It was as loose as that. Mm-hmm. But it was the, the group was run by a person, though I didn't know it at the time, who had a long-standing interest in things Egyptian. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I will tell you one one little snap, snippet from my, my first my first evening at that in that house. Um, he, he, everyone introduced themselves, which is the normal procedure for a group meeting up. And he listened to everybody's, everybody's, uh, contribution. And he just made a little comment and there must've been, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 people in the room. So there was a, a long pause and I was watch listening to everyone and reflecting on him, and I was very drawn to looking at him. And although I was interested in psychic things, I never really thought I was particularly psychic. And as I was watching him commenting on everybody else, literally in my mind's eye, I saw him wearing a black with a gold motif on his chest. Mm-hmm. And this image would not go away while everyone was making their contributions. I was thinking, what on earth is that? And so during a coffee break, I said to him very nervously, as you were speaking, I had a really odd image of you wearing a wearing something black with a gold motif on your chest. And he didn't say a thing. He didn't say, oh, that's interesting or how fascinating. He said nothing. Okay. So coffee break, coffee break finished. We all went back to the room. We all sat down. He seemed quite late because we were all seated. He opened the door. He came in wearing a black robe, full length black robe with a huge circular motif at his chest embroidered in gold. And like my mind just went into, um, into overdrive, I just couldn't mm-hmm. speak. I imagine, yeah. And yeah, and that that was the beginning of a much larger turning point. And I I stayed with that group for a, quite a while. Right, right. The, the, the real the real turning point came when um, he mentioned that he took people back to past lives. And, of course, I already believed in reincarnation. I had an interest in it. Um, And when he asked me, would I volunteer uh, for a session like that, of course I said yes. And that's where the beginning beginning of the end of my normal life came about. Uh, Okay, it was with like kind of... Um, opening to to your to your previous lives and then to to your experiences from other moments in your in your earlier lives, right? I had never been hypnotized. I'd read about hypnosis, and at that time in my life, I had no interest in Egypt. I was hoping to find a Georgian life because I was very interested in Georgian England. But it had turned out much later that my grandmother came from Georgia. So I think that was what I was picking up on. So I went for this evening session and 
he had prepared a massage table and laid it with blankets. It was very comfortable. I felt very safe. Just as he began to talk, my external reality just began to almost dissolve. And all I could hear was his voice. And then it was as if the eyes of my inner head opened and I began to see inside my own head. Does that make sense? I think it does. Absolutely. And yes. he said to me, what do you see? And I said, and I can remember it so clearly, I said, I see a wall with men animals on it. And he said, what do you mean, men animals? I said, well, men with animal heads are painted on this wall. And then I knew at that moment I was not in Georgian England. I was in mm-hmm. Egypt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's where it, the turning point of my life came with that. So ancient Egypt from the very beginning of your spiritual experience was a very important part of that, right? So all the time, I can say. Yeah, yes, that, that was the um, that was the key, the turning point of, of a new life, which in the end included becoming a writer, becoming a teacher, becoming a, interested in uh, in the Egyptian tradition, which came to me only very slowly, very, very slowly. My first interest really were in the mind and how the mind is very important in all magical work and all spiritual work. Um, and then in, when I was in that group, I began to learn about the tarot, which I knew nothing about. I learned some astrology, and I began to learn about the tree of life. And these are all components of Western mysteries, not especially Kemetic tradition. Absolutely. Um, and in, in that period of my life, uh, again, in through very odd circumstances, I, I met uh, some people who were publishers, and then they asked me to write a book on meditation. And again, if you would like, I will tell you the little story about that, because I had not planned to be a writer. I had not intended to be a writer. I went to a conference in London, and I was seated at a table with probably six or eight other people. And one of the people at the table worked for a publisher, and he said he was looking for someone to write a book on meditation. So I said, very, very, you know, shyly, um, well, I, I, I teach meditation. Have you ever written anything? Uh, no. So he said, um, do you think you could? I don't know. And he reached across, took a napkin from the table, and told and said to me, write an outline now. So I sat there and I wrote an outline and he put it in his pocket and he said, thank you very much. And then next week I got an email saying, we like the outline. Now can you write one on the computer and we'll review it. And that's how I became a writer. Amazing. So the real thing on the napkin that does exist, you know, it's, it sounds often oh, yeah. like those ideas on the napkin is like a, like yes. a story made up, but that's apparently no, you, no, really, no. Yeah. It, 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 you did it like that. <laughs> Absolutely. That's exactly how it happened. And I've had many odd synchronicities, as Jung would call them, in my life yeah. where two things come together that, that you did not expect, and that becomes a turning point. And in a very early stage also, of course, I don't know which was the very first book was on meditation. You said that, but um, yeah. the, also a very early book was The Elements of the Chakras, I believe. If I, yes, if, because <laughs> they like the meditation book. And then because you see in that period, which we now would be in the 1980s, mm. publishers were realizing here was a new market. This was the new, literally, it was a commercial enterprise. They suddenly realized that people wanted to know about these weird things. So I wrote the book on meditation, and then they said, could you write a book on the chakras? And I could because I'd learned a great deal about the chakras 
in the group I was in, including how not to work with your chakras, how to ruin somebody's health. (laughs) Oh, so I learned the hard way. So I was Uh very equipped to write that book. And And, and then uh, I also wrote a tarot book for them. Absolutely. In what sense the chakras relate for you personally to, it seems like, like, uh, as opposed to the tree of life or meditation or mm. Egypt, mm. this is like, sounds almost like a different chapter in your, in your knowledge, right? Is, is it, is it related to, to the Western tradition for you or how do you see it? Well, it was another chapter on my journey And basically, when I was in that group, um, I I had read a bit about the chakras, though, of course, there weren't many books available in that time in any case. But you can cause a lot of damage to somebody by mishandling their energy system because the energy system is the interface between the body and the mind. And so... I, I learned the hard way. It was a baptism of fire. I became very ill. Okay. Okay. Let's get back to the Kemetic tradition because how okay. and when did it become prevalent for you? How, when did you realize that among mm-hmm. all those things that you learned, astrology, tarot, yeah. you named them, uh, that well, it well. became the centerpiece of your work, so to speak? That's a very good question because I'd already made a long, long journey without it being especially focused on the Kemetic tradition. But through time, incidences, experiences began to funnel my life and my, my, all the things I did began to focus almost entirely on the Egyptian tradition. When I was um, at the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago, it would then be 1993, I was asked to take the role of the, um, the Oracle of Isis. And that cemented my relationship with her, which had already begun in the late 80s, Um, And I think through the 90s, it became... It became the the key. Once I'd written the um, the Aquarian Kabbalah, which was my contribution to Kabbalistic thought, the Egyptian tradition became, uh, as you said, more prevalent, more... uh, It became my central passion, whether I liked it or not. Um... I have two questions regarding that. One, you just mentioned that book, The Aquarian Kabbalah. Um, I know this is now not related to my kemetic question, but before we forget about that, what could you explain the term Aquarian Kabbalah, that combination which intrigues me? What What is it? What is Aquarian, the, the Aquarian Kabbalah? Kabbalah? Yes. The Aquarian Kabbalah was a book I wrote which married together the tarot and the tree of life into an initiatory system which is still, I regard, as the core curriculum of the house of life, which is my teaching school. Yeah. Um, Because to be in the mysteries, your mind has to be rewired. It, ha- it begins to work in a different way and it begins to think and function through symbols. And you learn that through, uh, through the, ta- the tarot provides a, a good training ground because the, the Egyptians thought entirely in symbols, in metaphor, in myth, in allegory. They do not think logically and deductively as we do, and we cannot approach that tradition while we still have that mode predominantly in our minds. But why is it called Aquarian in that context? What does that mean? Because, yes, because... It represented um, 
my view of Kabbalah, which was moving into the future and the age of Aquarius. Okay. The okay. book I wrote on Kabbalah is not a traditional book at all. So at, at the time, 93, rather at an early stage, Naomi, you were, uh, you just said, part of the World Parliament of Religions. Uh, um, and you represented uh, the religion of ISIS there. I find that fascinating. Can you expand a little bit on that? How did that happen and what did yes, it mean exactly? I, I was part, I had joined the Fellowship of ISIS. And to be honest, I can't remember when that happened. It was probably in the mid 80s but that is guessing from memory mm. um and well i ended up at the world parliament of religions as, as part of the delegation of uh, of the fellowship of isis right and during the 80s I think it, it was as if ISIS was trying to connect with me and I really didn't have sufficient training um, in the things that need to happen. Now, as I'm speaking to you, a memory is coming back to me very clearly from 1990. And that was probably my first big connection with ISIS, which is in is in the book, so I'm happy to talk about it. It's not a secret, and I've written about it elsewhere. In 1990, my friend and colleague, Caitlin Matthews, who's written many, many books, organized a weekend workshop in Hawkwood College, and it was called ISIS of 10,000 Names. Mm-hmm. And she asked me uh, um, to take on the role of ISIS. And when she asked me, I was very surprised. Now, I'll just explain a little bit more about the weekend, because the weekend was going to use one of Lady Olivia's rituals that she'd written, Lady Olivia being the founder of the Fellowship of ISIS. Mm -hmm. But Caitlin had been inspired to adapt the ritual that Olivia had written so that the entrance of Isis was not in anyone's script. Only Caitlin and myself and one other, two other people knew that that would happen. Okay. And the, the script, the ritual was about whether the earth should proceed towards its own planetary initiation. And instead of it being scripted, there was a, a space in the middle of the ritual where the participants could speak freely from their own understanding and say whatever they want. So it was kind of the trial of the earth, except of course the earth wasn't on trial. <laughs> So people spoke, they weighed up responsibilities, preparation and readiness, cosmic awakenings. All of this happened in a very informal way within a very formal ritual. Mm -hmm. And then when everyone had spoken and settled back down, the doors opened and ISIS Entered. Now, I have to say that I was sitting outside the hall beyond, behind to a wooden door, and yet as I sat there, part of the ritual but not really part of the ritual, it was as if a crown of stars was placed on my head. Okay. And... and when I stood up and when I entered the room, I was so unsteady on my feet. It was as if I was wading through the collected energies of every person in that room. And the intention was that I would walk around the circuit of people, go to the center where one of the characters represented the earth, and I would deliver the famous speech from the, the golden ass, behold, I have come. Mm -hmm. I began to walk 
And instead of doing what everyone expected, I, she, which is how I write about her, how I write about this experience in my book, I had merged with her consciousness. She stopped at every person and said something briefly. Mm -hmm. So I moved on very, very slowly. And when I reached the appointed place standing in front of the earth, I was literally overcome with compassion and I could hardly speak. And I spoke the words as they are there's given in, in the golden ass, the famous speech. And that was my first encounter, if you like, with the presence of that divinity. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It is a living presence. I cannot stress that enough. Yeah. I cannot you stress Enough. You have to help our listeners here a bit, and me, of course, and also um, Fellowship of Isis. I'm aware of that. Also, I'm aware of, if if I'm not wrong, that the creation year of the Fellowship of Isis coincides with your first experience that you mentioned before in in that Aquarian group. Um, do you see any? any yes. connection or is that or is yes. that just no, no, they are they are the 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 awakening in the aquarian group in 1976 mm -hmm. was the seed that then became uh my ability to be in the garment of isis in 1993 right that is a long journey Absolutely. Uh, um, I just uh, say, uh, said that, that the fellowship was created also in 1976. No, 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 right? no, no, no. The World Parliament was in 1993. The World Parliament, yes, but the, the yes. fellowship itself, I believed, was created in, in Ireland, I believe, in, in that is correct. It was probably created in the 1970s. Off the top of my yeah. head, I don't quite remember. Yeah, but, but you, there is no coincidence there. Okay. Yes. And, and, is it is it so that the fellowship of Isis sees the Isis the goddess also in all different aspects through yes. different world yes. religions, right? Yes, because she's called Isis of ten thousand names. Exactly, exactly. Does that play a role in the way you approach it? Um, my interest is has become almost entirely in focused on the Kemetic tradition mm -hmm. and the place of Isis within that greater tradition. Right. I, I get you. Mm -hmm. Understand. So um, there is a name that comes up when one searches your name on the on, on the internet, which really? and yes, a name which I really to me is important to me uh, who also am interested in ancient Egypt and the oh. Egyptian tradition. And that's Schwaller de Lubitz, the oh, yes. famous French um, oh, yes. well, chemetic researcher and writer. Mm -hmm. um, what is your connection to him? And uh, what, what, what do you have to say about him to our listeners? Well, <laughs> He was a radical alchemist, philosopher, mathematician. Uh, he sh is showing you the face of a high initiate of the Kemetic lineage. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I was introduced to his work, The Temple of Man, funnily enough, when I was in, in that first group. And it's, it's a hard read. It's a tough yes. read. <laughs> um, and in fact, I'm writing a new book um, as a follow-up to the Garments of Isis, and a great deal of that is is inspired by his teachings and his writings. Right. So he's a very important figure. Yes. And in, in many ways, he stands not opposed to the Egyptologists, because that's a little bit um, arrogant, yeah. but he is showing them what they are not seeing because he is looking through the eyes of spirit and through the eyes of a high initiate. So I have high regard for him and Isha, 
Yeah, and, da uh, she's his daughter, I believe, right, Isha? Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, I feel I feel very, very connected with their work. Uh, he uh, have you met him? Well, no, he probably he died too early. He died in yes, the 60s, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, uh, I must say that Isha's book also the uh, uh, the two books about which are that initiatic story about mm -hmm. that, um, about that young man. In fact, as you, as we speak, that book is no more than five feet away from me, and it's open because I'm using it. Really, it's there over on my bookshelf as well. So mm -hmm. the, the, we are connected through that. That's I can wonderful. only recommend that book also to everybody interested. It's a very initiatic book in a way. It's, it is, it's, but um, Isha writes in a way that is a little more accessible mm -hmm. and Aeor writes in a way that is deliberately not so accessible. Absolutely. You have to do the work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But let's get back to you, to, to Naomi. So okay. um, um, when, when 90, we are in 93, we yeah. are after that world parliament of, yeah. of religions. Um, how did it continue for you then? How did you get more and more into that thematic um, world? 1993. Um, I think I had begun to write the book that you have in your hand. Mm -hmm. But that is to say I'd received a seed only uh, when I was in Melbourne. And uh, it says, it says uh, in, in that book that I, I tried to write it four times. Yeah. Each, each time had a slightly different title and each time had a slightly different emphasis. And the first time I thought it was done and I looked at it and it was it was not good enough. So I, the, the book eventually took me 10 years to write, but I yeah. received the seeds of that in many ways by being that garment of ISIS at the, at the World Parliament because the connection with her was so intense and that's all I can say. So unexpected to my, my ordinary personality self that it, that was another awakening which spurred me on to understand more about her place in the tradition. Because I do recognize that many women are drawn to ISIS. Mm -hmm. And I have learned in recent years that you cannot separate any of the divinities. You cannot just choose Isis without also understanding her relationship to Osiris, to, to Horus, to Ra. You cannot, you cannot break the Kemetic tradition into parts and choose the bit that interests you. That may be how you begin but you will eventually learn that it is one unified, holistic, mystical, mystical participation. Mm -hmm. You cannot chop it into pieces. And this is what my new book is about. Absolutely. And I think that's very essential because, as you just said, one could, even by the title of the book, one could be misled, uh, believing that it is all about ISIS, but mm. it is certainly not. It is ISIS as a starting point, maybe, but yeah. it, it becomes, as you just said, much more holistic. Yeah. Um, Maybe it would be good um, in the introduction to your book, you talk about those three principles, the principle of simultaneity, the mm. principle of pairing and mm. the principle of association. Mm. And if I get you right, those three principles are crucial to what you just said uh, about that holistic approach, right? They are because they're actually showing you the, the way the Egyptians thought, which is uh, totally connected view of life. When things are associative, they are connected. When things have that simultaneity, they are connected. We have lost all sense of that. 
in our world. And yes. we are much the poorer for it. Absolutely. But do you think that what you in what you suggest here in this book, this um, holistic approach to life in general, in our life in the 21st century, mm. can be regained? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. I think in many ways we are struggling to find our way back to this sense of connection because ho holistic this and holistic that, it's become a 21st century buzzword. Yeah. Well, the Egyptians couldn't conceive of anything else other than a holistic view of the cosmos, not just their social order. Their social order was part of the cosmos itself. We are struggling with <laughs> joining up two dots. Yeah. I don't think it can be regained. That's, I think that's part of what I'm trying to do through the House of Life, which is my school. Mm -hmm. And it, I ha it, it is called the House of Life Mystery School of Divine Partnership. Divine Partnership. It's about learning to extend your hand towards the divinities and they will answer you back and they will take your hand. That's for certain. <laughs> Uh, are you talking, when you name it partnership, are you talking about the partnership between uh, human and divinity or is it a different partnership that you're addressing here? I'm talking about a partnership between, between the initiate and the divinity. Right. Let's interrupt here and uh, bring to you another piece of music by Hassan Ismail, who has already appeared twice on the Thought Hermes podcast with his, um, with his music. And it's a great pleasure to have him back again. And well, the next piece is very adapted to uh, today's topic. It's called Pyramids of Light. And it's from his new album, The Ancient. And, uh, well, I don't know if that album is exactly the newest one. Uh, we have another one, uh, another album, which is called Space Embrace. And that was actually the first piece we heard as within. That was from that new album. And The Ancient, I believe, is a, uh, an album that has existed for uh, some time. Um, anyway, we're going to hear Pyramids of Light now. And then I'll be back with Naomi for another 36 minutes of an exciting interview. And I hope you enjoy it just as much as the first part. We talk a lot more about the book in that second half. And after that, third piece of music by Hassan, by Hassan Ismail. And that's again from another, from another release, from another album. And that one, I believe, is also new. It's called Entropia. Well, also very esoteric, very hermetic as all his music. And it's actually the title song from Entropia, which is called, yes, Entropia. So once again, we are now hearing Pyramids of Light by Hassan Ismail. Then I'll go back and talk to Naomi Ozaniak in the second part of the interview. And after that, immediately Entropia by Hassan Ismail from his album, which is called also Entropia. And after that, of course, I'll be back for next week's guest announcement, so to speak. Right. So let's go to the Pyramids of Light.
Would it be possible, you think, to expand from your end a bit on those three principles that I just mentioned? Mm -hmm. Because I, I believe they are so crucial and they are a good introduction to people to know more about your book, in my sense. To the Egyptian way of thinking? Yes, those principles of simultaneity, of pairing and of association, yes. They, they seem very simple. So things that often seem simple are not simple. <laughs> yeah. And they deserve to be reflected upon, to be meditated upon, and to be applied to the world as it is today. So my answer to the question you have posed is that I would throw that back to the listener and say, what in your experience is association? To me, the sun and the moon associated, but we don't think of them in that way or not often enough. You cannot separate anything 
You can't separate a tree from the water that fl- flows from the sky to create the tree. Yeah. You cannot associate. You cannot disassociate anything in nature from everything itself. And simultaneity means that things are happening all the time, continuously in a cyclic fashion. Day and night are cycles of time. As soon as you separate those things, you destroyed the holistic perspective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and when you talk about pairing? Yes, things being... The Egyptians were very fascinated by this concept of duality. Mm -hmm. It runs very, very deep in in their thinking. You have the red crown and the white crown and the uh, left bank and the the right bank, Nile, day and and night. But they they are polarized, but they are not oppositions. Yeah. They are part of something greater. And that's what that sense of pairing is. When even when they paired even Horus and Set, who usually you think of as being enemies, but they were able to reconcile that through the light and the dark are part of the same thing. And you see that also in the in the pairing in general in the Octuadic tradition, for example, you have those four pairs of Yes. Deities which are probably opposed if you take them from modern contemporary way, yeah. but as yeah. you just said, they are they necessarily they, they belong are, together. They are, um, they are p- the, the creators the, uh, of all that, you know, the, of the world yes. that we see. Exactly. Exactly. That. exactly. And when I hear that, of course, what comes to mind, um, especially the principle of pairing, is classical hermeticism, because this what is above is below, etc. Yeah. That that's exactly what is expressed in that principle of pairing, as you yes. just explained it, yes, right? It exactly is, and and what is interesting to me is that we we, f- we do fall back on the hermetic tradition, obviously, but where did that come from? Mm. Well, it, it came it came into Greece through Pythagoras and Plato, and where did they learn it? They yeah, learned it, in Egypt. It, it, so, it's a, a Hellenistic tradition, right? Uh, because yes, because uh, which came out of the Ptolemian period in in, in Egypt, of course. That, yes. is, that is right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So in ma- in many ways, you do see that reflected in the Hermetic tradition. Absolutely. In what in what to what extent um, in your book and especially in your personal work and approaching uh, a chemetic um, religion if i may name it like mm-hmm. that for you um, um, in what to what extent hermeticism in the I, I hesitate to say classic way because mm-hmm. what is classic hermeticism that doesn't really exist but uh, Let's put, talk about the hermeticism like the Neoplatonists would then mm. uh, use it later on, right? And um, in, in to what extent does that hermeticism play a role in your way of approaching things here? Uh, less than it used to. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I was most immersed in the hermetic tradition when I was writing the Aquarian Kabbalah, and okay. uh, that was very much my introduction to the Western mystery tradition. And now I'm much more focused on, if you like, the rootstock itself, because I do see the Kemetic tradition being the rootstock of hermeticism. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Thoth is regarded as being, you know, one and the same of Hermes. Well, I now work more directly with the Egyptian the Egyptian deities. Right. Right. And I would I would just like to say something here because we tend to we want to call the Egyptian deities gods and goddesses. Well, that's not really their language. Mm-hmm. They regarded them as being the living forces of nature, self-renewing, exactly. living eternal forces of nature. The Neteru, right? That's what this term means. The Neteru. And their tradition, in my perspective, was not about worshipping these so-called gods and goddesses. Mm 
That was not what they were doing. Working with the Netaru, this is a technology of consciousness of finding harmony with the forces of the cosmos, which are personified and exemplified through these figures that we want to call gods and goddesses, but the Egyptians didn't. And I think you're touching on something very, very crucial here, because, of course, like in all approaches of of history in general, of especially the history of spirituality, mm. um, our problem of contemporary people that we are mm -hmm. is that we see that very easily through our eyes of the 21st century and have a hard time to this put is, our knowledge into, yeah. into a thinking that is different. Th right? This is absolutely crucial point. Um, Aor himself will tell you that you cannot approach these mystical, they're not even concepts, this mystical communion mm -hmm. with the rational, logical mind that we go about our lives with, it does not work. He, he says that it's like taking an axe to the sea. You will get nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, and and the Fortune exactly. talks about that because this is why the Aquarian Kabbalah is in many ways a serviceable intermediary because it teaches you how to think symbolically. Yeah. And until that happens... Until you have constructed that as part of the initiate mind, the Kemetic tradition will remain closed and bewildering. Yes, absolutely. We are approaching it with the wrong language. Yes, absolutely. So, so how do you suggest that uh, a newcomer, so to speak, should do that? How, how should he or she approach the comedic tradition in order not to fall into that. Yes. Yeah. Well, looking at, looking at my own journey, I had very few teachers. My teacher was Isis mm. over the years. And what I've done in writing the book you have in your hand is to distill the principles that I learned on the way. So that book is a, is a distillation of 40 years of struggle, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my own, my own uh, teaching school um, is there for people who are, it, who are called to this. It is not just having an interest. You have to be called to this tradition. It has to awaken in your heart. Otherwise, you will not, you will not stay with it. I mean, the, the question I'm asking you, sorry, I have to, I have to just hook into that for one moment. Yeah. Um, uh, that might sound like a stupid question, but I, I need to ask it on behalf of our listeners. Uh -huh. um, how do you do that? How do you, how do you find out that, that this is a call and not just an interest? Oh, if you try, you, you will know, hmm. you will have that sense it's an irrational, non-rational sense. Mm. Um, it may come to you in a dream. You may even just read a word. You may see a picture of ISIS and something will happen to you inside. Now, if I can just spend a, a few moments just talking about my own awakening to that. Please do. I, yes, absolutely. It was in the, in the group, which we've discussed. Um, during one summer, the, the, I knew nothing about the tarot then, and I mean nothing. Uh, the, the teacher decided to run a course of um, seminars on, on the tarot. And because the, because the high priestess is the second card, it was very soon that I found myself in a room and he'd made these beautiful slides. So there I was, a newcomer to all of this, suddenly seeing... Uh, the, the card of the, the high priestess in, blown up onto a wall in front of me. And as I watched that, mm -hmm. as, as I saw it, something happened in my consciousness, mm -hmm. something completely non-rational, irrational, and uh, deep 
when I, I couldn't explain. And that was my experience of the call of Isis, seeing, if you like, her through the card of the, the, the tarot image of the high priestess, because, of course, that card is called She of the Silver Star, and that is Isis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was another mini seed on the way. If the call exists in you, probably through far memory, it will awaken in its own way and your conscious mind will register what has been given to you. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah I, I understand what you mean. Uh, I mentioned Isha's book, Herbach, uh, oh. earlier, and that's what, when I read that for the first time, which is now 40 years back, oh. um, that's a bit what, what oh. occurred to me back then, because it made very much sense when I read that book. So, oh. yeah, I understand yeah. that. Yeah. So um, let's go back to your book that I, as you say, have in hand here in oh. front of me. Um That might be just a little, a little thing, but it just struck me. You have nine, nine, nine praxis um, yeah. concepts in here. We come to that in a moment, which yeah. you put into three times three, right? <laughs> and call them temenos, temenos one, two, and three. And mm. temenos again. I don't insist. I understand. I got you, but it's just interesting because that's a term, of course, which the ancient Greek used to use for their temples mm. uh, and temple buildings, etc. Yeah. Um, why? Why that terminology? You see, sometimes when I'm writing, I'm writing through inspiration, not intellect. Right. And. All of those, um, that, that division of the book was entirely inspirational. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I received that that I could proceed with the, with the book. Okay. And because the comedic tradition is actually one of personal revelation. Yes. And that's hard to explain, but that is that has been my experience. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I, I can see what you mean. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. So maybe we can go a little bit into those um, nine phases or meditations, uh-huh. or I don't know what you would like to call those nine parts of the book. What, what would you? What would be the name you would give to them? I think they are nine steps. Nine steps. Okay. Three steps, because the the first one, the heart mind. These are these are. Ways of entry into the temenos, the temple, mm-hmm. of the heart mind. And the heart mind <laughs> takes on a sacred place, a sacred identity. Yes. And these And- are the way the book is written. I think that these are steps that any serious and interested and genuine reader can apply to their life. And if they apply it to their life, change will begin. So it is like a path, um, an initiatory, in, yes, initiatory yes, path yes, yes, that, that, that uh, you have to take in the order step by step like you described them here, right? Yes. You, you cannot think, oh, I don't need the heart mind bit. That's boring. I'll just do the soul mind. Oh, that sounds much more interesting. Yeah, you cannot yeah. do that. It's like saying you want to put the roof on the house before you put up the walls. It doesn't. Yes. Um, so maybe, could you just, I mean, you just mentioned the heart mind. Mm-hmm. So the three temi, Teminoi are called the heart mind, the spirit mind, and the soul the mind, mind. In, in, in the book. Um Can you briefly um, introduce each of those three, what they consist of, what they mean? The heart mind is the beginning of learning to live through the heart, not so much through the intellect, which is where we live. Mm. And the heart was very important in uh, comedic thinking. And... The the, the heart was central. And they talk about the weighing of the heart at the end of your life. Mm 
yes. which is when your deeds, your words, your thoughts, your actions are weighed against the feather of my art, and that is also the feather of shoe. And if those deeds balance, then you have lived a um, a good a good life in harmony with Mart. If those if it does not balance, then you have failed to live up to the teachings of my art. Um, can, can, I, I mean, um, most of our listeners will know about the feather of Mark, but I find it such an intriguing and interesting concept that one simple feather can throw over the balance um, of of a life, even if a badly led life, it can be turned over by something like the feather of Mark. Mm -hmm. And that I would love you as a specialist, as a really knowledgeable person on that matter, just hear you. One more minute about that, if, if that's possible. Well, Ma Art was the absolute, she was the heart mm. of comedic thinking. She yes. was present in the social order, in the cosmic order, in the way people lived in community, in the way they ran their lives in a personal level. So Ma Art, the harmony of Ma was what glued ancient Egypt together. And so her symbol was the uh, the white feather, and this is the white feather of Shu, and Shu is one of the is the uh, one of the early uh, members of the Ogdoad, the creator mm -hmm. of air. And air is a air is a concept that we share. Yes. Nobody owns the air. Mm -hmm. So this is taking you back to the ability to lead that shared life and Ma art, the, the law of my art, which is about justice, harmony, is showing you how to do that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, that feather of shoe, good that you remain, reminded us that because it's not just a feather, it's that. No, no, no. That, that, this is something I, 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 I learned quite recently. It is not just the feather of my art. Mm. The feather belongs to one of the creators of creation, shoe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, again, the Egyptians were always harking back to the first time, the first creation, Zeb Tepi. Yes. That's where they take their lineage from all mm -hmm. the time. So the feather of Mart is coming into existence with creation because it is the feather of shoe. Absolutely. Yes. Very important. Absolutely. But I'm sorry I interrupted you before because I just had to hear you on Mars. Yeah. But uh, you were talking about the heart, mind, uh, but there yeah. are two more minds, of course, that we should talk about now. Yes. The, the spirit mind and the, the soul mind. Yes. And the heart mind, they, they flow. There is a sequence from the heart mind to the spirit mind to the soul mind. And they are achieved through the application of ordinary human facilities, ordinary human capabilities. Mm -hmm. There is nothing um, alien or um, bizarre or occult about them. They are the application of ordinary human abilities, dedication. Yes, or transformation Trans also. Dedication brings transformation. Yes. Meditation brings transformation. These are the skills, the practices you need to put in place in your life mm -hmm. so that you can become that initiate mind. Right. And that leads to the soul mind, so to speak. Yes, the, the soul mind is the least accessible and... They are the qualities of initiation, <coughs> mediation. These are the things you would learn in mystery school. They are, mm -hmm. the, if you like, the higher octave of very ordinary abilities. And when I talked earlier about the, the partnership 
between the divine and the mortal. <clears throat> mm -hmm. This, in part, is done through mediation. In the Western mystery tradition, it's called mediation. Yes. Standing in between the two. Okay, that, that's what is meant by it, I understand. Oh. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately these nine steps lead to initiation, which to me is not an event, it's a process. It's a process of turning in, a process of approaching the, the, the netaru, and this is the whole purpose of many traditions as it happens, but Absolutely, my yeah. tradition is own, I only know about this tradition. Yeah. But I say I think you're saying something uh, very important here that um of course this tradition is the path that you chose, that you know about that is your path because it speaks to you. Yeah. But there are other Western traditions that Uh, describe a kind of yeah. related, let's put it that way, there way. Are, there, right? are yeah, there are many other pathways. And yeah. um, a lot of these ancient traditions are called the, the perennial wisdom. Yes. Exactly. And, and they all serve the past and they still serve the present. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Aldous Huxley comes again. In, exactly. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> yes, definitely. A very underestimated writer, yes, actually. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, you call that last chapter the create creation of the inner light, right? Mm. Um, is it for is it possible to describe what the inner light is in a few words, or is that something <laughs> not to be done? Um, mm. <laughs> That's very hard to put into words because in sure it, is. it is a it is living life through a mystical sense. Yeah. And they are words that probably don't make any sense in a yeah. rational sense. Exactly. And you have to live it and well, you, you have to experience it. You so have to live the path is the path in all traditions the path in all traditions is to be lived. Yeah. When you live yeah. it, you are on the inside already. Yes. When you just read books about it, you're still on the outside. Yes, of course. Of course. Well, that, that leads me, thank you for doing that, because I had that question on my mind and it leads me perfectly into that. Um, is what you are suggesting in your book, is that solitary work, can it be done just by yourself? Um, does it need to be in an egregore, to use oh. that word, or um, how? Well, most, how do we need a teacher, or how do you well, how do you suggest? Most that? of my forty year journey has been entirely solitary, right? And I currently live as a hermit in a forest. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's part of an answer to your question, but of course, it's not the whole answer. Uh, but you have you have 40 years of experience. That's was, the that's, that, but to answer, your, you know, my, my journey was solitary and yeah. my intention now is to share the fruits mm -hmm. of that journey with mm -hmm. other people who also have heard the same call. I do have a teaching school. I will be doing some teaching on Zoom because this is the magic of the age in which we now live. Yes. Um, I, I think this journey is a solitary journey at heart. Mm -hmm. I think you begin alone, mm -hmm. and I think that's th – this is what um, Leonard Cohen calls the, the bitter searching of the heart. Right, right. You have to ask those big, big questions. You have to desire to want to have answers. You have to travel, even when people around you tell you you're crazy or they aren't going to travel with you. You have to keep traveling. And when you do that, you will get a response. Mm, And it can be... Oh, what would the word be? It can be alluring to travel in a group and do very little work on your own. Because you're so much looking on the others that you don't yeah. see yourself. Yes. 
Oh, yes. Ultimately, you know, in alchemy, they call it the great work, and it's a solitary work. There's no, there's no way around it. Uh, I don't know if you made that experience, but I find it interesting to hear that the the period now that we just went through the last two years with those lockdowns mm. due to COVID, etc., mm. um, that that brought to mind of many esoteric uh, occultist workers mm. that the fact of doing your work as a solitary by mm. yourself has maybe more quality than mm. group work maybe i'm uh, maybe i'm partial on that but um, i have the impression that even larger groups i don't won't name any yeah. here now, but i found out that through zoom work etc they can just as well do their teachings and leave to work to each member themselves mm. Would you would you share that opinion, or would do you have another another well, view? I, I would just come back to what I've said, which is that ultimately, the journey is a solitary one. Yeah, yeah. But nevertheless, having said that, I have um, in the past uh, led groups in uh, in ritual, mm -hmm. and that's when you're choosing the people you want to work with to to create an event and a ritual event is a shared event of course so, and, and your 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 first your first um, experiences were also in the group yes yes Absolutely. yes mm -hmm. and i think in many ways when you are on this journey you are searching for those other soulmates who also are on that same journey. So it's only natural to want to find a group mind where you can feel comfortable and sustained and nurtured and understood. Yes. I think that's just human nature. Absolutely. I think you have to be on the journey before you rely on the group. That, yeah. I think that's what I, I think that's probably my view. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I have one. Well, I have two two questions more to go. We are mm -hmm. already almost at the end here, but I have two more questions that I have to ask you. Um, when I hear you talk about those nine stages, and mm -hmm. and um, and also when you talked about Mart, especially, um, I hear vocabulary that is very much related to our very contemporary problems like integrating nature into our yeah. daily life and um, divinity not being something abstract uh, um. beside but part of life etc um, so is the way you practice this um, kemetic religion can we call it religion would you agree to that word Kemetic, to me, it's a kinetic, kemetic metaphysics. I never used the word okay. religion. Yes, I, I would. I, I would have thought so because yeah. I just wasn't aware what you were using. Okay, so yeah. kemetic metaphysics. I, I also personally prefer that. Um, would you say that this is also a very contemporary approach? I, I think the the way the ancient Egyptians viewed the cosmos and their place in it is much needed today because it is all the things that we have lost. Yes. We have no sense that we are part of nature because look at what we've done to the planet. Yes, absolutely. And e Egyptian metaphysics was drawn from looking at nature, from observing nature. Mm -hmm. That's where they drew it from. And working with nature. And working, working, if you like, through my art, with nature. And yes. the, uh, the Netaru were conceived to be metaphysical living principles that worked through the world, through nature. Mm -hmm. This is so important because we have this very strange separation between God who lives in the heavens somewhere and mm -hmm. we live on earth and um, what more can I say? Yes, <laughs> I see what you mean. Yes. The Egyptians, their gods were implicit in the sunrise, in the sunset, in the hours of darkness, in the hours of light, in the yes. waters, in the air. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we tend to think that the Egyptians 
had a pantheon of gods. Well, I think I've already dispensed with the fact they didn't use the term god. Yeah, absolutely. They personified, made sacred every aspect of nature. Harpy yeah. was the god of the Nile. Yeah, what absolutely. Was the rivers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you find that in classical hermeticism, then in in the elementals, right? Yeah. What they call elementals. That's in fact, to me, a kind of rendering of what Neteru meant, right? Or yeah. means. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. I, I, you asked me earlier on about how is it possible to to recapture some sense of what the Egyptians, how they looked at the world. And I, I do believe it is possible, and more than it is possible, it is actually much needed today. Yes, absolutely. It's much needed. Their, their viewpoint on their place in the cosmos is what we have lost and what we will benefit from if we can regain Yes, I'm, I'm absolutely you, busy on that. Yeah. You, just, just to conclude, because I know we're running out of time. No, we're not. Never. We're never. That's a good thing about <laughs> podcasts. You have no, it's not a radio show. You don't have well, to that, finish. No, that's wonderful. Time. Don't tempt me. Um, <laughs> I, I live in a forest um, on my own, although I do have work away help, helping me. I have mm -hmm. a big piece of land. I have the River Mondego is... I can see it from my window. I can walk to it. Mm -hmm. I have uh, two ponds on my land. I have a stream. I have fruit trees, which I have planted. So I get up at, I don't know, four o'clock in the morning to do my writing. Mm -hmm. And then after my breakfast, I do four hours on, my, on the land. Mm -hmm. So in that way, That's not my life. My life has that sense of integration, isn't there? Is no separation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, great. That's and I, great. I have a beautiful river just down the hill from me. And yeah, yeah. Good for you. Really good for you. Um, now, we, one last question I do have for you. You, okay. you. you touched on it a bit earlier, but maybe you can give away a little bit more on that, um, you, on your next project. What, what will uh -huh. be your next project? Mm. Well, my next project is I've been working on this book for about two and a half years. Mm -hmm. I think it will take me another two years minimum And all I can say is that it's um, <clears throat> a broader, wider, deeper, deeper look at the Egyptian tradition, in which of which Isis is clearly a part. Yes. And again, it has uh, it has praxis within it that an ordinary person can follow and enter the tradition through that. And until and a, and it, a lot of it is inspired by uh, Isha and Eor. Okay. Um, and again, I spend a lot of my time just reflecting and waiting for the next paragraph to be delivered. Okay. And that usually happens about four in the morning. Okay, so that's in, well, uh, it's now 10, which you're in six hours. You should oh, be my goodness. Out there. Well, it's sometimes <laughs> at two in the morning. But yeah, it's a work in progress. Yes. It's a work in progress. Yes, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Well, fascinating. Um, uh, one additional, last little thing. Um, do I get you right when you call it the garment of Isis? This is also this is not just a female approach. This is a holistic approach for all it, it, of us, right? It is a holistic approach for all of us. And yes. I know there are many male devotees who adore Isis as well. Yes, absolutely. And so they I think are a garment because she. She descends upon you. She's not yes. looking at your gender. 
Yes, no, I, I, it was important to say because mm. one could be misled maybe if one mm. doesn't think the right way. Well, thank you so much, Naomi, for oh. this very interesting talk. I'm really glad we did thank that. Thank you so much it's, for inviting me to share these things. Thank you so no, much. It's a pleasure and um, all the best for your work and for... Uh, well, maybe we'll talk again the, when the next book is... Uh, that would be lovely. That would be really, I'm sure I will be informed uh, about that. So thank you so much so much and um, have a good time in Portugal where you live and um, I hope that we will speak once again soon I'm sure we will, thank you once again for your time, thank you
Entropia from the album by the same name by Hassan Ismail. Thank you, Hassan, for your music once again. It's lovely to have you back on the show. And thanks a lot to Naomi Ozaniek for her time and for especially for her knowledge, for her input, all that she told us in this lovely interview that we had. And thank you to you all for listening, of course, and being here with us this week again on the episode number 16 of season eight of the Thoughts Hermes podcast, which by that comes now to its end. And uh, I hope to have you back on episode 17 next week, next week. And I'm sure you all now want to know who will be my guest next week. Okay, and it's the return of Gary Lackman. Gary, who has already been my guest here in a full episode and even twice on the former Ex Libris shows that you might remember. Um, so, and this time we are going to talk about dreaming and uh, pre premonition through dreaming uh, from a little book that he wrote recently and which he has strong opinions and knowledge about also. So we're going to talk about that. And in the second part of the interview, we're also going to talk about the book that he released already two years ago, but which is very relevant nowadays, his book on Holy Russia. So we're going to have a talk about that as well, at least part of the show. Okay, good. That was it for today. I hope you enjoyed. I hope, as I said, that you will be back next week. Um, for the time being, I wish you a good week, a good week, which brings you more knowledge, more interesting stuff. Maybe you go on Kaikobad Radio and listen to it a bit. It's really worth it. And um, yeah, well, that was it. Take care. Stay tuned. Hear you soon.